Freedom of expression and freedom of religion are ideals most Canadians hold near and dear to our hearts. But often it appears that some rights are more dear to our judiciary than others. Joining me now from Calgary to discuss this further is John Carpe, President of the Justice Centre for Constitutional Freedoms. Welcome back to BCN, John. Good to see you, Hal. Now, you're representing a number of estheticians in BC who are being taken to the BC Human Rights Tribunal for declining to perform waxing services for a trans-identifying person. And one of them is Blue Heaven Beauty Lounge and its owner, Sandy Banipal. Can you explain the story in a little more detail? Well, Sandeep is a Sikh woman of the Sikh religion, and to help support uh, her family, she works out of her home to provide what's known as the Brazilian bikini wax, and it's a very intimate service, which she provides for women only. Uh, she was contacted by a person who can only be identified as JY, and JY uh, is a transgender person with male genitalia and asked for the Brazilian bikini wax. And uh, this woman's response was along the lines of, you know, sorry, I don't do this for men. And JY said, well, uh, I'm not a man, I'm actually a woman. Uh, but he, the hearing took place in Vancouver on, uh, on July the 4th, and uh, JY has admitted to possessing male genitals. So... Uh, we'll see what how the Human Rights Tribunal responds to that. But JY filed a total of 13 complaints uh, wow. against women, many of them immigrant women, uh, East Indian women, Sikh women, who do not want to, uh, who want to provide services only to women. And the Justice Center is now acting for three women in uh, two hearings already took place and another hearing coming up on July 17th. And we are arguing that part of the charter right to security the person is that no woman should be forced or compelled by law to deal with male genitalia if that woman, as an esthetician or waxologist, wants to provide services to, uh, to other women only. Now, why is it wrong with declining this kind of service if it's not something that really lines up with your personal beliefs? We've got human rights legislation which uh, now include in BC, Alberta, Ontario, every province, as well as federally, we have gender identity uh, and gender expression are prohibited grounds of discrimination. So this is why this, this person, JY, has gone ahead and said that, uh, that JY wants to have the, the Brazilian bikini wax and forcing this. Uh, JY was... Um, in, in some previous cases, uh, has withdrawn when he learns that the woman is represented by a lawyer. But prior to that, he tries to extract a settlement and say, well, pay me, you know, pay me $5,000, pay me $2,000, and uh, I'll go away. Uh, but now we're at a point where three of these hearings have actually proceeded to the uh, Human Rights Tribunal. And there's a total media boycott. Uh, the CBC was not there, Global Mail, National Post, nobody was there. And, uh, you know, I think that's uh, probably because the, uh, the media have a bias. And uh, this case shows that the political correctness in Canada has gone way too far. Uh, but I think a lot of media don't like that. And so they're, they're trying to give it the silent treatment. Uh, but there's somebody on Twitter that has sent out tweets that are being read by thousands of people all over the world. Somebody was in the courtroom and sending out tweets so the word is getting out. Do you think this could be precedent setting? Oh, absolutely. It's precedent setting in, in some way, shape or form, because the human rights ruling would be expected sometime, you know, in the next month or two or three. And uh, it's quite possible that whoever loses at the hearing stage, whether that's JY, the complainant, or whether it's uh, one or more of the women that JY has complained against, uh, it's very likely um, or, and quite possible for the unsuccessful party to appeal it to the next level, which is the Supreme Court of British Columbia. From there, I could go to the BC Court of Appeal and so on. But and it, it is an important case uh, in spite of facts that, that sometimes cause a bit of a chuckle, but it, it's actually quite serious. I mean, this is about your right to not be forced by law, by a government body, but to, uh, to provide very intimate services. 
John, I know a lot of non-religious people who would be very uncomfortable with a female being required to make house calls to a male client's home for genital waxing. Your thoughts? Well, that was this. Uh, that was the second case that's already been heard. That one was heard on on July the fifth. Now, this woman was not being asked to to wax genitals, but was being asked to wax arms and legs of JY. But um, this woman has it does not want to go to the home of uh, uh, of a man and perform that kind of service. And uh, it's also a vulnerable woman. Uh, you know, doesn't speak English that well. Uh, this is how she uh, she helps to earn family, uh, earn money for her family and so on. So um, on that one as well, the security of the person should mean that a woman should not be compelled to go to a man's house and perform, you know, even that's fairly intimate. Waxing arms and legs is a somewhat intimate service. John, let's talk a bit about massage therapy. A lot of us, you know, go visit an RMT. What if a female client asked for a female massage therapist, but all the therapists were male? Could she sue for gender discrimination? Probably yes. I mean, this is the uh, this is the absurdity of where we're at. When the when the human rights laws were first uh, came into being, they were sold as uh, you know, anti-racism measures, and a lot of people thought that that, that sounded well and good. Uh, but but they absolutely interfere with our freedom of association and freedom of contract and the freedom to set up certain kinds of businesses. Um, a few years back, I heard of an oil change place that was uh, women run only. All the employees were, were female, the, uh, the owner, the manager. You know, if, and I think that's fine in a free country, if there's a bunch of women want to have uh, set up a, a women only oil change provider. Uh, but, you know, I wonder if there had been some guy that had applied for a job there and if they said we don't hire men. Um, could have probably gone to the Human Rights Tribunal and gotten a ruling. We had the case in Nova Scotia of a Muslim man in a karate studio, karate school, and insisted, I was judo, pardon me, and said, well, uh, in my faith, I can't touch another woman. Well, these are judo lessons, and you get partnered up with somebody else, and you do grab people by the shoulders, and you know, there's some touching involved in judo. And the Human Rights Tribunal says, oh, no, no, this... Um, uh, this this uh, judo studio has to uh, change its practices and teach judo in a way that that this person's not going to have to, you know. It's uh, but until people start to uh, take more notice of it and change the legislation to make it more appropriate, well, uh, we're going to be stuck with these kinds of stories. John, my daughter took judo, yeah, and it's a matter of grabbing the person's arm and you throw them over your shoulder and you roll them. I mean, that's what judo is, really. I mean, you can't really change the way you teach judo. But let me ask you something. If the BC Human Rights Tribunal happens to rule against you, what message does that send to people of faith? Well, to this one, it's not really targeted at, at people of faith per se, but, but to people of faith, yes, and, and to other Canadians, it, it sends a message that, we're really losing some of our freedom. If you don't have the freedom to disagree with somebody else's self-identity, I mean, it's one thing uh, for an individual to have the, f it's one thing for a man to have the freedom to say that he identifies as a woman and, you know, maybe uh, acts like a woman, wears makeup, wears female clothing. That could be part of your freedom of expression. It's quite a different thing to demand and, and impose through force of law that other people start referring to you as a woman. And this is where we're at with the human rights legislation. So if this case is lost, I mean, it will be appealed, right? So we'll, we'll get a, a higher court ruling at some point, but it certainly uh, takes away from your freedom and my freedom when the government compels you to um, pay lip service to somebody else's beliefs. In a way, it's a form of coerced speech. I mean, again, it's, it's one thing if, if a guy says that he's really a woman and calls himself Mrs. Or, or, or Ms. and so on, okay, fine. But it's a very different matter if the law forces other people to agree with that and to express agreement with that. That is a form of compelled speech. John, there's an interesting case involving the University of BC, which did allow controversial activist Jen Smith to give a public lecture on campus. But tell me what the catch was with this and maybe explain to our viewers a little bit about who Jen Smith is. Jen Smith is a transgender person, but uh, a man who likes to dress up like a woman. 
but uh, has been very outspoken uh, against how transgenderism is being pushed and promoted in schools in British Columbia through the uh, SOGI 123, which is Sexual Orientation Gender Identity 123. And it's a curriculum that starts uh, to tell kids at very young ages, uh, starts to tell boys, well, you know, there is no such thing as a boy and a girl, and you might not be a boy and telling girls you might not be a girl, which a lot of parents, um, there's a legal case in Ontario, parents f feel their, their daughter was harmed by you know, the authority figures, teachers, telling her that, that uh, you know, she, she's not really a girl and she's a boy, she might be a boy. Anyway, Jen Smith has been very outspoken about this. Uh, I has the opinion that, you know, if you want to get into all the transgender stuff, you should wait until you're 18. And uh, has been a source of, uh, has been targeted for censorship. I mean, talks have been shut down and disrupted while, you know, police stand by and allow this to go on, even though disruption is actually uh, illegal. Anyway, at, B at UBC, uh, Jen Smith was going to speak there and did speak there. And uh, to its credit, UBC said, you know, we support free speech, so this is going ahead. However, they used the censorship tool of the big security fees, which in my view is completely wrong because it punishes the speaker who's doing nothing wrong and it punishes the speaker's audience who are people that just want to come and listen. They get punished with having to pay security fees when the security fee should be imposed on the the mob of, of people who want to engage in uh, disruption or obstruction and shut events down, which is criminal conduct. They're the ones who should get the security fees. Here it was uh, imposed on the event organizers. John, can you chit chat a bit about the cases involving a couple of registered charitable groups, two Bible camps, who applied for the federal summer jobs grant program but were denied? I'm guessing this ties in with last summer's controversial attestation with applicants being forced to agree with the Fed's position on abortion in order to qualify for the grant? Yes, in, in 2018, the, um, the federal government made it a condition of accessing this federal program that provides small, I think about $5,000 grants to small businesses and to nonprofits to hire a summer student. And it was a condition of accessing a federal government program that you uh, check off an attestation box saying that you agree with Justin Trudeau's opinions about abortion. The Justice Center took this to court. We acted for uh, an irrigation business in Southern Alberta whose owners did not want to tick off this box. And uh, in response to this court action and others, fortunately, the federal government did change the attestation. So you no longer have to tell the federal government that you're for abortion and transgenderism in order to access a government program. So that's good. However, uh, they're still trying to go after pro-life groups. The groups that we represent in 2019 are not even pro-life groups, but there is a Christian summer camp that uh, applied and no reasons were provided except it kind of raises some suspicions because this same uh, Christian organization the year before had refused to take off the attestation for 2018. So we've taken that to court and we're going to force the government to come up with some very uh, express specific detailed reasons as to why this was refused because uh, right now we don't know. Recently, the Justice Center had the opportunity to testify at the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights, including its study into online hate in Canada. John, can you offer an update on that, and what are some of your concerns? Well, the committee has made recommendations to bring back um, human rights legislation that would ban hateful speech. We have to remember we already have criminal code prohibition on the willful promotion of hatred. And uh, <clears throat> the criminal code prohibition comes with some defenses, such as truth, which is good. If you can sh say that, that what you're saying is true, you're not getting into trouble over hate speech. Um, also, uh, an exemption for raising a topic of public interest and also expressing an opinion based on a religious text which of course would protect, uh, say, Muslims, Christians, Orthodox Jews, who in their scriptures say that gay sex is sinful, would protect them from criminal prosecution uh, at, at the behest of, of gay and lesbian lobby that, that would say that that's hate speech to 
express a religious view on on sexuality. So we already have that in place, but uh, this committee wants to extend the ban into human rights legislation where you do not have these protections of truth and uh, expressing an opinion on a religious text. Could you actually be charged with hate speech for maybe disagreeing with gay marriage, even though it's legal here in Canada? Well, we've had human rights proceedings uh, already in, uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, there was a case where somebody had a, a bumper sticker on his car. This was about uh, 15, 20 years ago when there was a big debate on about gay marriage. And it was a little stick men, uh, kind of a stick men showing man holding woman, a uh, man holding the hand of a woman, yes. Uh, two men holding hands, no. Something like that uh, will get you into trouble with human rights laws. Now, these are not criminal proceedings. They're similar to, for example, if you get a photo radar ticket or you get a speeding ticket, right? It's not criminal, but it's still, uh, you're publicly branded as a bigot when a complaint is filed against you. And if you really want to defend against it, you're going to be out of pocket $10,000, $30,000, $50,000 wow. in legal bills. So um, we really don't need uh, anti-hate laws to be extended into human rights laws. They're already in the criminal code where you have appropriate protections for an accused person. Uh, but if we put this back into federal human rights law, uh, we're looking at a considerable loss of freedom of expression and religious freedom. John Carpe, president of the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, thanks a lot for joining me today from Calgary. Thanks for having me on your show, Hal.